What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is December 21st of 2017. Well, folks, I am absolutely ecstatic to have the man himself, Charles, Hop Charles Hopkinson, on an interview today behind the Cardano project. I've been meaning to get him on the channel for a while, and ironically, someone actually reached out to me at the same time I was going to uh, send him an email because uh, I'd seen in the Reddit community he was happy to do an interview. So, Charles, I'm happy to have you on here. Really big fan of the Cardano project. I've been reading more and more into it. And I know, of course, as we can see, both through the community and the price, everyone's getting really ecstatic about it. So first and foremost, uh, I just want to let you all know it's going to be a really fun interview. Kind of laid back, asked Charles a few different questions. Uh, we're going to be talking about Cardano. We're going to be talking about a few different things that people in the community have been asking about. But first and foremost, I want to start it casually and really get to know Charles for those of you out there who don't know him. So Charles, uh, take it away. Tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, talk about some, maybe your, uh, some of your previous work with Ethereum. Okay. Well, first, Nicholas, thank you so much for having me on, and uh, thank you so much for your interest in Cardano. I mean, I, uh, when we first did this project, we didn't know if anybody was going to like it or not. It was just gonna be like an academic thing, and we'd occasionally have a guy who emails us every now and then says, hey, that's pretty cool. Can I help? But uh, it's, it's pretty overwhelming and humbling. Uh, so uh, I started in the cryptocurrency space, actually, quite by accident. You know, I read a couple of white papers, and... Um, I've also been a big fan of peer-to-peer -peer technology for some time, and I, I have a, a bit of a libertarian cypherpunk, um, you know, blend, which was most of the first wave cryptocurrency mm -hmm. people tended to come from that uh, that space. And so I, I said, uh, you know, I need to do something, but I didn't know exactly what to do. And so I, I have an educational background. I studied mathematics, and I said, well, you know, here's what I'll do. I'll create a class, a free course. I'll put it online. I'll give it away under a Creative Commons license. I'll call it the Bitcoin Education Project. And, and the goal is to bring lots of people into Bitcoin and teach them why the revolution is so magical and so amazing. So uh, I uh, went to Udemy because at the time that was like a really nice, easy platform to use. It yeah. was free. Uh, and I released a class called Bitcoin or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Crypto. Because I'm a big Peter Sellers fan. I, I figured that would be like a, a nice plan of words. And I ended up getting about 70,000 students. I got over 5,000 emails, and it gave me a great opportunity to, to get to know people and to also get a deeper understanding of the types of things people were concerned about. Uh, when you get to meet that many people, when you get that much interaction, it gives you a really good chance to start a, a business. And uh, so I leveraged that to do so. And uh, what I really wanted to do was to make cryptocurrencies a bit more resilient. And the, the hot topic of that time around 2013 was uh, about decentralized exchange and uh, value stable currencies. So that, that hasn't quite gone away. It's been <laughs> supplanted by sexy things like scalability and smart contracts, but it's still a very valid area of research and something we all think about, especially as we see exchanges fail or you know exchanges get shut down or you know, everybody's going through compliance issues. Or if you want to do things like remittances or credit, where you know if your currency goes way up and way down every day, it's impossible to do that. So uh, the maiden project for that effort was called BitShares still around you know mm -hmm. people still like it Dan uh, it was basically dan larimer and i's best guess said you know what could we do uh, to achieve a value stable currency in a decentralized exchange part of it worked part of it didn't work but the thing i learned from it is just how difficult it is to build a cryptocurrency and also change a cryptocurrency once you've deployed it you know you get all these emails like well we love everything you've done but can you change this one little thing and we're like well no that's the whole point <laughs> You know, it's a cryptocurrency. You can't change it. You know, but at the same time, you think about it. You say, "Well, I can see it from their perspective. If they had this one little thing, this would be the best thing ever for them." So, as a consequence, we uh, we really needed to have some sort of way of putting like sub protocols on top of the protocol. Right around the same time, there were a few people who were thinking about this idea, this notion of smart contracts. Uh, Circular Learner had written many things in the early parts of 2013 and, and even some before about attaching a Turing complete programming language to a blockchain. And Vitalik Buterin was also thinking about this because he was working on the Color Coins project and the Master Coin project. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he was running the same problem we were running into where uh, he kept trying to do something and it was just brutally difficult. And he says, gosh, why don't I just have a programming language on top of a blockchain? <laughs> like we do JavaScript with the web browser, you know, and then mm -hmm. it's really simple. So uh, I knew Vitalik through Anthony Diorio, and uh, Anthony told me that uh, Vitalik was thinking about doing something along these lines. And so I got a very early copy of the white paper. At that point, it wasn't even a full blockchain. It was an overlay protocol on top of mm -hmm. PrimeCoin, which gives you like how, how, how old school exactly. Ethereum might be. <laughs> That's uh, wild. So anyway, yeah. It's pretty often told legendary story at this point about the, the Miami Beach House and all the other things. And I was only around for about six months. I was there from... December to uh, late May, early June. 
uh, and uh, help the project through its very early stages kind of find its identity, find its footing, find its marketing, find its you know preliminary technology. Uh, and uh, got them to a point where they get funded and bootstrapped, and then Vitalik and the rest of the guys took it from there and turned it into something that uh, is truly impressive. You know, so from from that point on, I I had to make a decision whether I wanted to stay in the cryptocurrency space because I haven't really found at that point like a project I really liked. You know, I did BitShares and I did Ethereum, but I guess I'm a difficult guy to work with because I keep keep being the odd man out. Uh, so I, I said, well, if I'm going to do this again. I'm not going to do protocols. What I'm going to do is create a factory for protocols. So I'm going to build both a research company and an engineering firm. And, and we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of the science of cryptocurrencies and the nuts and bolts into how to build cryptocurrencies. We're going to be very opinionated and we're only going to hire people we want to work with and so forth. And let's go see what happens with that. So I started IOHK in early 2015. And the very first project we got once we started the company, uh, Jeremy Wood and I, uh, was the Cardano project. And uh, Cardano was really a reimagining of what one can do with cryptocurrencies. It said, okay, you know, Bitcoin, it proved that you could have decentralized money and create artificial scarcity and actually have a decentralized transaction system where you can push value between people. But these transactions are really slow and they're dumb and, you know, they're just never what you want them to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so then Ethereum comes around and says, well, can we at least make the transactions smarter? You know, this idea of a smart contract and they can do all these really cool things and they're really easy to use and they're templatable and you can build libraries and eventually you can build up this beautiful, you know, hierarchy of functionality that will allow you to do all kinds of cool applications. And that was a great idea. But then the problem is with both of these systems is that they just simply don't scale. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see with CryptoKitties or, you know, any of these basic <laughs> applications, the very first thing that people try to do is try to get off the network because the network itself is too expensive and too slow. It's the same with the Lightning Protocol. It's the same with all these guys uh, who, you know, like uh, like the, the big blockers. They, they, they say, well, maybe, maybe we still have to use like an overlay or something. Uh, so the issue here is these systems don't scale because they're replicated. And, uh, and as a consequence of that, Basically, they'll never be practical. They'll never grow to millions of users or billions of users. So you know, from one lens, we wanted to do a project where we really push the limits of scalability. And we tried to get something like what uh, BitTorrent has gotten, mm -hmm. where, you know, if you're downloading Game of Thrones, you get it really quickly, right? Because a lot of people are downloading it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you download, try to download like uh, Pee Wee's Great Adventure, maybe it doesn't come to you <laughs> soon, because maybe it's not as popular as, uh, as Game of Thrones, right? So... It would be so cool if when we gain users, our networks get faster. Mm -hmm. We get more processing power, more transactions per second, more scalability. That's a very distributed systems notion of scalability. So at the very least, that's one of the things that we wanted to do is say, can we get everything we got with Ethereum, just make it better and get everything we got with Bitcoin, but just make it better with, with good engineering, good processes. Uh, but then at the same time, can we get a system that as you add people, you get more resources. Mm -hmm. And there were two other design criteria that fit into that. You know, One, one was interoperability. And the other is sustainability. So interoperability is pretty easy to understand. It's hard to achieve. But basically the idea is that you're not going to have one coin to rule them all. There's not one master coin to bind them in darkness and we have to take it to the heart of you know, Mount Doom and, and throw it in. Mm -hmm. The reality is that there's going to be a diversity of opinion, just like there's a diversity of languages and a diversity of religions and a diversity of governments and so mm -hmm. forth. So you need to have the ability to translate from one system to another system. So we said, boy, wouldn't it be really nice to solve the interoperability problem while we're solving the scalability problem? Because then this will become like a master protocol that's really easy for people to use as an on and off ramp to all these other cryptocurrencies. And by extension, it will enable all kinds of great decentralized applications to interface with these types of things. Um, it won't be the only standard, but at the very least, it'll get us there just like TCP IP or other things have really gotten the internet where it needed to be. So uh, interoperability was a bit complicated as well, because you really have to ask, well, what the hell does that mean? Just like scalability, you have to have actually a notion. Is there an analogy we can look at? We look at BitTorrent and say, ah, I want the movie to download faster when I gain more users. So similarly with interoperability, I, I want to have something where as I gain more currencies, I st it's easier and easier to integrate. And, uh, and also it's easier to understand what's going on or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, you can break that problem into two parts. One is interoperability with cryptocurrencies and the other is interoperability with the legacy system. So there's a good story and there's a bad story. The good story is that with cryptocurrencies, it's a pretty straightforward problem. You just create a compressed representation of a blockchain and then you just say, okay, 
if I get a transaction from that, can I just look at that compressed representation and prove two things? One, that the transaction actually has funds that exist, and two, it hasn't been double spent. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that all that side chains research that we've been talking about for all these years is a really good avenue to figure out that approach. Um, from the legacy system, the bad news, the bad story is that you can't guarantee interoperability because their systems have to evolve a little bit and their systems have to grow a little bit. But what you can do is make their lives easier by giving people the ability to add metadata and attribution to their transactions so that when they enter that system, there's some context that they can use to understand it from a compliance perspective or from uh, you know, origin funds or whatever the heck they need to know to, to be able to use these types of things. So that's the second pillar of the Cardano project is this whole goal of pursuing interoperability. One is by doing a lot of cryptographic research so we find better ways of representing other blockchains so we can understand things that come from. And the other way is a more practical business sense of what standards should we follow and what hooks should we allow people to use so they can attach identity and metadata and other such things to their transactions so they can interact with the system. Now, these two things alone, if we accomplish them, would probably be worth more than Bitcoin, but I don't do small projects, so I, I want to do something really big. And so I, I said, let's let's go for the Trinity. Let's go for sustainability as well. Mm. And there's again two parts to sustainability. One part of sustainability has to deal with the idea of paying for things. So we have this idea of the ICO. You go and yeah. raise a bunch of money, whether you need a token or not. Well, let's say maybe the ICO was a good idea. Here's the problem: it's finite. You can't do an endless ICO unless you're EOS. <laughs> raise about five or six different rounds and stuff and say it's right, coming exactly. eventually just wake up and say hey maybe we should do 10 or something like that <laughs> who, who knows but anyway you know levity aside you, you know it's really hard to do an endless ico so at some point you're going to run out of capital so mm -hmm. how do you finance development especially when these systems become really complicated and they're, they're hard to maintain expensive to maintain usually super complex software like linux or android or windows they live within a benefactor who has some business model that permits them the resources they need to spend the, the millions to billions of dollars to keep these types of things going and evolving as technology changes. So from a sustainability perspective, you, you have to come up with some sort of model where you can refill the well without having to do an ICO every month or something like that. Hmm. So one thing that we got really intrigued about was the idea of a treasury system. And we can talk about that a bit later. Definitely. But basically the, 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 the long of the short of the treasury system is that it's uh, a, a pool filled by inflation where participants of the network can vote to empty that pool for projects they care about. Mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, if you're a developer, instead of working for a company, you can work for the blockchain. If you're a mm -hmm. marketer, instead of working for a foundation, you can work for the blockchain. And they if can you vote host to conference, allocate the funds. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And 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 then p the people who own the tokens can vote to allocate this. So it's not a new idea. It's been around for a while. We, you know, we had a proto idea about it and BitShares and Dash has taken it in directions and Zencash has it and Zcash has it and Pivx <laughs> has it. And we have our flavor of it that we think is pretty good. But, you know, that's a pretty good idea, I think. So the other side of it is voting on changes to the system. This is kind of what Tezos is attempting to do, where you have a representation of what the system should look like, both on the network transaction and, and uh, consensus side of things. And you say, okay, for these components of the system, they have version one. Mm -hmm. And then somebody comes along and says, let's upgrade it to version two, whatever whatever the heck that means. And there's a debate about it. And eventually, uh, if there's consensus, you get to version two. And now version two is the official version, right? So you have to come up with a way of representing these things. And then you have to come up with a voting system that allows you to approve or reject. Now, our hypothesis with Cardano is that we can actually reuse the same things for a treasury mechanic for protocol upgrades. You just change the weights. So you have a different quorum that's required and a different amount of voting that's required. And uh, we, again, can talk about that in a, in a little bit if you want to. But, but those are the three pillars. It's basically this idea of sustainability, the idea of interoperability, and the idea of scalability while maintaining all the things that make Ethereum great and maintaining all the things that make Bitcoin great and also cleaning a lot of stuff up. Now, you have to have process to get there. And the problem is that as you go from generations, you know, first generation Bitcoin, second generation Ethereum, third generation Cardano, you encounter an order of magnitude increase in complexity. Okay, so Bitcoin is real simple. You can write it up in a few thousand lines of code, uh, you know, in a sufficiently concise language. A specification is not very big because all the hard problems have been solved at this point. We have a pretty good mental model of what it ought to look like. Ethereum is a lot more complicated. It takes a lot more work and effort because you have a VM and you have to maintain stateful things and these things can talk to each other and you have like a pub sub network model. And there's a lot of stuff going on there that you just don't need for Bitcoin. 
And then when you start talking about third generation, you're talking about the capability to understand arbitrarily many other systems. Mm -hmm. You're talking about being able to provision metadata and attribution. You're talking about voting systems. You're talking about lots of game theory. You're talking about uh, much more complicated consensus algorithms and network protocols and data layers and so forth. So all of these things uh, necessarily mean that it's very easy to screw up. As we've seen with, with Ethereum, it's already showing its signs of where poor engineering or poor design decisions have resulted in uh, moral hazards or you know lots of loss of money. So we said, if we're going to do this, we're going to go back to that principled approach that IOHK set up, which is we are going to go ahead and uh, follow peer review and follow formal methods. And, and everybody says, oh, well, everybody's doing peer review. I publish a white paper and people read it. Like, That's not how peer <laughs> review works. Peer review means you actually write an, an academic paper you submit it to an academic conference, and there's this weird guy with thick Coke bottle glasses who doesn't like you, who makes your life miserable on the committee uh, until until somehow you've satisfied him, or at the very least got him to weak accept it, uh, and then you go and present it for another round of beating. And, that, and so peer review is not easy. It's very expensive. It's a very slow, methodical process, but it does tend to produce very good research. And then in terms of formal methods, uh, it's not just good enough to write papers. You actually have to build them. You have to actually implement them. And the problem is that if you just go from paper to code, you're probably not going to write it correctly the first time. And as a consequence, even though the paper is correct and it's been vetted and it's good, the code is not and the code will break and you have a big failure. So formal method is like something that lives in between where you pull out the intent of the cryptographers and the computer scientists and you write it in a way a computer can understand and you can have actually test outputs. And then you can actually prove that the code you've written when you get finally get to the engineering set of things is correct. It's called a bi-simulation proof. This is not commonly done in software development. It's very rare. It's done only usually in high assurance applications like mm -hmm. jet engines and medical software where, you know, if you get the blue screen of death on your pacemaker or on your jet engine, you're not going to be a happy camper. Or it's done with aerospace software like, you know, the Mars rover where, you know, if it crashes while it's on Mars, you can't go to Mars and kick it. And reboot <laughs> it. It's done, right? So mm -hmm. you have to go ship another one. So uh, the good news is that NASA and others have invested unlimited amounts of money like mountains of it into this type of stuff and it is definitely useful in industry and if you really want to go down that road it just again it's more complicated and time consuming so those are the principles the heart of the cardano project we like to say here like uh, process over people we don't care so much about the people or the cult of personality around them rather we just care about what processes do we follow to achieve excellence so you start with some very well-defined goals so scalability you know as you add people your your system gains uh, resources interoperability you can talk to as many people as possible and sustainability you can pay and decide and then you adopt a process that's very principled that's tried and tested and has worked in the past that allow you to systematically grow and walk your way over there so back in 2015 that was the dream uh, we got a fairly sizable contract to be funded until 2020. So it was a nice little five-year project, almost like a DARPA project in a <laughs> certain respect. Uh, and we've been chipping away at it since then. And uh, we launched the first version back in September. Uh, it was a little bit more popular than we expected. So we're like, wow, that's crazy. And uh, we have a great roadmap where every six months we're kind of rolling new stuff out. So the next version will be Shelly, where we turn on a lot more features of the system. And shortly thereafter, Gogan will have the smart contract layer. And then a lot of the scalability ideas and interoperability ideas and sustainability ideas will shortly thereafter turn on. And then it's just a matter of uh, reacting to how the markets received it and then uh, adding in new capabilities as overlay protocols like MPC and state channels and uh, trusted hardware support and these types of things. And we can get into that if you want to. So that's the summary of kind of my journey through the space and what we're doing with Cardano. And I think we got that maybe in what, five minutes, 10 minutes? <laughs> no, I, Charles, I got to tell you, I've never had someone be able to just describe their project like that. That's very impressive that you can lay out the core principles like that because. I generally got it. I remember watching your whiteboard video the first time I saw it. And the one thing that I think you really drilled home, and this is what I pick up with the third generation cryptocurrency, is that system of governance and sustainability. Because I see continuously, I mean, I think all of us know it in the regards to Bitcoin versus, you know, Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin Cash. There's continued splits in the network, and this is, I think, in my opinion, destroying a lot of the infrastructure, and people can't come to consensus. So because of that, I think that whole sustainability aspect, and you also can mention the DAO hack with Ethereum. 
you're left with this third generation of cryptocurrencies that first and foremost, I think, need that system of governance. And then you can get sustainab or, uh, sustainability out of it with scalability as well as interoperability. But well, I like you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Really important. There's an old saying, which is stability within the domain. Yeah. So the problem with Bitcoin and Ethereum is they're unstable within their domains. Mm -hmm. So let's say you want to be a payment system. Uh, you know, it's becoming a victim of its own success as it, as it grows and grows and grows. There's no way for it to be sustainable. So it, it, what has to happen is you have to put all this monkey patching in or overlays or other things and somehow to make the system operate. So similarly with Ethereum, there is no way right now with the way Ethereum is constructed to write really good software within it and actually make that software scale and deploy to a reasonable user set. So our hope is uh, to create a system that is that is sustainable within its domain. So you know, if you look at uh, sustainability, uh, if you get that right, you're going to bring in millions of users. And if you're not scalable, well, then the system will break with those millions of users. Mm -hmm. So you know, you've you've accomplished nothing. And the and the other thing is that uh, if you get a system with millions to billions of users, that system necessarily has to have the capacity to talk to other financial systems. Uh, because it has to be useful for businesses and enterprises so you can have very natural integration with like credit cards and debit cards and atms and legacy financial systems and non-financial systems as well so uh, and, and that and that way you're porting your principles that that protocol carries into those domains as well so our this is our best guess of you know what pillars do we have to have to have this thing be stable within its domain and actually useful and uh, and live out I don't want to build a protocol that only lasts two years or three years. Mm -hmm. It's not worth spending five years of my life or 10 years of my life going through all this science and engineering only to be supplanted by something else that maybe doesn't follow our same principles. I would much rather build something like TCP IP that's built to last and it lasts 40 years. And even if it looks very different in 40 years, it looks different because of evolution within the system. Mm -hmm. You know, this is as much a standards body as it is a protocol. This is as much a funding body as it is a protocol. It's like we're building a new NSF in addition to an IETF, in addition to a banking layer, in addition to uh, Amazon EC2 and so forth. Uh, so, you know, it's an insanely large project and we're probably crazy to try it. Uh, but, you know, if you're going to spend your life doing hard things, you, you might as well do things that if you pull them off, change the world. And that's uh, that's why we signed up for this. Yeah, I agree with you, Charles. And it's good to hear that, you know, you're talking about at the beginning, your kind of background and being kind of part of the whole cypherpunk kind of, you know, early stages of cryptocurrencies, because I think that's where you're really going to find the innovation in this space. Uh, it's the people who were here originally who agreed with decentralization, who saw the potential Bitcoin. So, no, Charles, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you're looking at the long term of that, because most people aren't in the ICO space. Um, <clears throat> So a lot, there's yeah, a lot of things we uh, we got to get covered in a short amount of time. I want to talk to you a little bit about high assurance code because that's something that really interested me. Um, in regards to uh, previous crypto projects, we see that there's a lot of worry about hacks, a lot of worries about people building decentralized applications on top of the blockchain and not having using languages that are built with security in mind. So in this regards to high assurance code, uh, I'll leave an article down below, guys. I, I think I mentioned it in my Cardano video. Um, that talked about how there was a team of people who used, uh, they, they got a group of hackers and they gave them six weeks to break into a little bird and they couldn't do it because they used high assurance code. So Charles, I'd like you to talk a little bit about, you know, high assurance code and why that's important. If, if you could definitely take the time to talk about it, I'd love to hear your opinion. Okay, sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, all full disclosure, I'm not a, a, a proper expert in high assurance software, <laughs> but we certainly do have a few in our company that are like computational logicians and this is what they do all day. But, you know, I do not write cock code and Isabel code and, and so forth. So so basically it, it starts with, do you know what you want to do? And do you understand the consequences of what you want to do? This is called a specification. So let's say you're a cryptographer and you write a cryptographic algorithm like uh, RSA or DLP or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have a high level math description of that thing. Now, once you've uh, decided that description and you've modeled your adversary and all these things, you can write proofs about it and, and demonstrate that that thing is secure given certain assumptions and conditions. At that point, you have this mental model, which just says, ah, okay, well, in my ideal world, I have proven, at least to my peers, beyond a reasonable doubt, that what I've described will behave this way and this way only, hopefully. So that's the first step. And then the next step is saying, okay, how do I make a computer understand that? And then the next step after that is how do I make a computer actually run that and execute that with users? 
Okay, so these are kind of your three levels. The, the first is the conceptual level of writing proofs, writing a paper, and making sure that they're correct. And by the way, you can even validate those proofs in a machine understandable way. That's the other direction and quite hard to do, and we're doing a little bit of that, but it's, uh, it's involved. Uh, for example, uh, Kepler's conjecture took 10 years to prove this way. <laughs> a very large team and 50 man years of effort. So I wouldn't recommend going in that direction because it's, uh, it's a rat's nest. Mm. All right. So when you, you put these things together, then you say, all right, if you do all three of them, then you have what's called a high assurance stack, where if your security is baked into your design and your design is machine understandable, you're then able to prove that your system is secure. Now, this has been done before. For example, the SEL4 microkernel project, where they said, let's design an OS microkernel that actually has all the confidentiality, integrity, and availability guarantees that we care about to have a quote unquote secure kernel, you know, a kernel that's free of defects. Now, this is really important because you'd like to put that type of a kernel, let's say, in drones, or you'd like to put that kernel in applications where if it failed, people die. So they spent many years and a lot of money to go down that road. But it's just basically that concept. You write a paper, you very clearly define what you want to do. You extract from that paper what's called a, a, a high order logic, a dependent type language, a description that a machine can understand. And then you prove that the code you've written actually corresponds to that. So if you put an input here and an input here, let me grab another pen, <laughs> an input here, then, uh, then basically the outputs will be identical for all inputs. Okay. okay or by simulation proof. Now, the actual techniques and methodologies on how to do that, there, there are a, a huge variety of opinions. Um, some of them are connected to the functional programming world because functional languages tend to be a lot easier to verify, but there's actually ways of verifying non-functional languages as well. Imperative languages have their own frameworks, but in general, functional languages, because of the way they work, are a lot easier to write verification for. So on our end, what we do is we write Haskell code. Mm. Now Haskell by itself is not high assurance. That's the first thing people have to understand. It's a great language and the compiler prevents you from shooting yourself in the foot. And you have a lot of techniques you can use with types and the very fact that you can encapsulate state changes into monads and you have all that magic in that area gives you a lot of power and robustness about quality control. But at the end of the day, it's not high assurance software you still need to do the job of writing a specification for whatever you're attempting to do and baking within that specification the security properties you want to have. Then you need to do the job of showing that that Haskell code actually is the same as the specification, that they're one and the same. The only difference is potentially performance or you know, a couple of superfluous features which aren't relevant to your security domain. So we do this. And um, if you go to our GitHub repo, you can you can take a look at some of the code. Uh, we use Isabel and SciCalculus and literate Haskell and other such things together to, to try to accommodate these types of things. And we'll be increasingly doing it as our protocols increase in complexity. So the first protocol that we've been making high assurance is our consensus algorithm, Ouroboros, which is like the heart of our system. Every, every cryptocurrency needs this because you have all these users and the users have to agree on facts and, and events and in and, and time. So you need something to kind of keep them all order, organized and decide that this happened before this. And that's a really hard classical problem in distributed system theory. So uh, we built an algorithm called Ouroboros that we think is the best hope of being secure, efficient, as well as scalable. Mm -hmm. The problem is whenever you build a new algorithm, it's really easy to miss something up. And so we felt that it was important to implement this algorithm in a very high assurance way if possible. So if you go to our repo, you'll see for our next generation of our protocol, it's called Ouroboros Prowse. We've begun the effort of um, very rigorously showing that it's uh, that it's provably secure as well as that it's uh, high assurance. And then we're going to do this uh, for other parts of our stack as well. For example, we're obsessed with multi-party computation. We're really interested in trying to figure out what verified computing looks like, verified uh, implementation looks like with multi-party computation. We're also really interested in you know other parts of our system. But the long and the short, the 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 the, the um, average everyday person understanding of it is, it's just a different way using math, logic, and a lot of careful thinking to write software, which is slow and deliberate. Mm -hmm. But the output of this is that you have a very, very high degree of certainty that all the dumb, easy to make mistakes are gone. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you're bug free and it doesn't mean that uh, your system will completely behave every way that you've intended because reality is reality. C cosmic rays can flip bits and, you know, uh, fiber optic cables can be cut. Uh, you know, facts and circumstances can still happen. 
but it's the best way that we know of as software engineers to write software that will work correctly over a long arc of time, not just not just weeks to months. Now, there's another caveat to this, mm-hmm. which is if you anticipate changing your underlying protocols a lot, you really can't use a high assurance approach because every single time that you update the protocol, you have to reprove that the update of the protocol uh, still has the same properties that you have. And if this is a very slow, methodical, expensive process, uh, then uh, then you wouldn't be able to do that. So uh, we kind of have a hybrid approach at IOHK where core infrastructure that we do not anticipate changing much goes through a rigorous high assurance eventual development. Mm-hmm. And then we're looking into like medium assurance technology, like liquid Haskell, for example, where you're adding refinement types to Haskell, where this is not necessarily going to give you high assurance, but it's going to be a hell of a lot better than naked everyday Haskell code. Uh, but it, it doesn't give you a big development slowdown. Maybe you add an extra 20 or 30% to your development pipeline, mm-hmm. but it's it's considerably better than everything before. And by the way, Haskell's like five times better than Java, <laughs> you know, maybe because it's just so much more concise. I mean, for every five, 10 lines of Java code you write, you'll get one line of Haskell code. And also the compiler prevents you from making a lot of mistakes. So even naked Haskell is pretty good. And you add liquid Haskell to the fray along with quick check and other techniques, uh, you're bound to get very good software, as long as the software is actually implementing reasonable protocols, which is why peer review is so important in the process. Awesome. You awesome. know, I was, what I was going to say real quick was, um, um, I think I'm coming on your end a little bit. I think I'm coming on your end a little bit. Here, let me mute my mic. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. But no, what I do like is, um, you know, with Cardano in this regard, I'm not only seeing, of course, the trend of peer review, and I'm surprised to this day, you know, you said everyone's doing peer review and stuff, but really no one in the crypto space is doing this. You see no ICOs that are, you know, ICOs that are going and raising millions of dollars doing no peer review whatsoever. It's very, uh, it is very tedious, but at the same time, if you're trying to build sustainability for the long term, that's really good. And in the regards to what I was leaning towards yeah, for that. Comment on that. Yeah. So mm-hmm. to be fair to some projects, they have built foundations on peer review reviewed uh, mm-hmm. papers. For example, Zcash, uh, that paper was written oh, yeah, by Zcash. academics like uh, Green and uh, Miller and others. And, um, you know, Zuko is a good guy. He's very smart. You know, to be fair, Zuko didn't fully develop all of these protocols out. He just mm-hmm. took the engineering side of it. They came out of academia. And if you look at other things like Enigma, for example, uh, this is uh, like MIT kids working with Alex Pentland trying to do some MPC work. Again, there's an, at least an intent to have these things inculcated Mm -hmm. and incubated within a university and inculcated with a peer review process. But uh, yeah, you're accurate in that we're the only ones who actually seem to have the reliable capability of consistently writing peer reviewed papers Mm -hmm. and doing them in a very bespoke way. So we're not taking someone else's paper uh, and implementing it. We're actually building the paper for our needs and then actually surviving the rigor of peer review. Now in terms of conferences, we've already been admitted to Crypto 17, ACNS, uh, we've just had two paper papers accepted to Financial Crypto. We've submitted something to Oakland. We've also submitted something to Eurocrypt, and we feel that we have a pretty good chance of um, getting in. So, uh, and these conferences are are quite difficult to get admitted into. And another caveat is that in the normal peer review process, journals are king, but in the computer science world, conferences are the way that peer review is done. So, if you're an academic from a different field, you'll be like, oh, but conferences aren't very rigorous. Who cares about that? <laughs> no, no, actually, in computer science, it's the opposite. You don't get tenure without your papers appearing at uh, at conferences. Uh, so these are rigorous conferences. Many papers accept, uh, submitted, very few papers accepted. Uh, and we consistently seem to have the ability to do that. Why? Because we hire really, really good academics, like people with, you know, Real credentials. They're no, professors. I've, I've seen the whole list of the uh, input output Hong Kong team. I mean, not just the team dedicated to Cardano, but just the whole list of individuals. You have people who have a long history as developers, engineers, people from all types of different backgrounds. So, uh, I mean, it was one of the most impressive lists of people that I've ever seen in the crypto space. I mean, and it's not just about hiring them; it's also about putting them in the right environment. Mm-hmm. You know, when you say, "Hey, we don't pursue like intellectual property," and the end goal of this process is that we actually get you published at a major conference, that's a very strong incentive for an mm-hmm. academic to, to work with you because they know that their research is going to be read, it's relevant, uh, and they have the freedom to continue to grow their career. Whereas in normal industrial research, you know, you have to set aside your hope streams and the things you like and go work on the things for someone the else's dream. <laughs> And and you hope that maybe the company likes the same things that you do, but usually yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. And you know, you see, you kind of you kind of bite your lip and say okay. And also, a lot of your work you can't publish because it's proprietary and secret. 
You know, if you look at the HoloLens, for example, that's an engineering marvel and a masterpiece. And there's probably so much amazing research that went into constructing that device, a lot of which will actually never end up in a paper uh, enhancing the CVs of the engineers and academics who worked on it uh, just because of the competitive nature of the industry. And that's just really sad and it's really unfortunate. So we at IOHK really try to make a good environment for our, our, our academics and our engineers saying that you're going to have an opportunity to publish. You don't have to give up being a researcher just because you go and work in industry. Uh, and oh, and by the way, if you get accepted, you get to go to the conference and actually go present your paper. Uh, and uh, you get to be a colleague amongst your peers and, uh, and, and still stay in that environment. But you're doing directed research. It's actually going to go into a live production system. It's going to get implemented in the most rigorous way possible. And you get to see that product work. You know, that's usually not the case for many of these scientists. They'll just write one paper after another. And once it's been accepted through peer review, they kind of move on and go do something else. Permacoin is a great example of that. Permacoin is a brilliant idea for using proof of work uh, to build a archival database. And uh, had that research thread been followed to this logical extreme, it'd probably be file coin on steroids. But, you know, it's one of those papers where their academic incentives don't align with the industry incentives. So they just kind of moved on and went and did other things. And we, we thought that it's really, really unfortunate. So that's another component of the Cardano idea is that not only do you get to work on these things that are academically relevant, because it's cutting edge state of the art research, but also it's interdisciplinary where you get to blend cryptography and distributed systems and game theory and programming language theory and other things and work with colleagues that you frankly would never talk to and never do anything with and never jointly publish with. But then you get to see them realize in systems that potentially could change people's lives. Uh, so it's a, it's a great environment. People very rarely leave and uh, we have a heck of a lot of applications and it's getting so hard to vet people and time consuming <laughs> that we have a big recruitment backlog. No, it's I did. I, I saw. I loved it at the end of uh, the video, uh, the whiteboard video. I saw a while ago and said you guys were hiring, and that's good. I mean, there's a lot of talent out there, but it is hard to find because this space is always trying to find good talent. And hopefully, hopefully they'll come to input output in Hong Kong and stuff out of any. Yeah, we, but we don't hire anybody in the cryptocurrency space. We really don't. It, mm -hmm. It's useless to me. Most of the people here are full stack developers who can't find their head from their ass. <laughs> And they just have this huge ego and saying, I can leave at any time and do an ICO. So you got to pay me a mountain of money and treat me like God. Jeez. And I'm like, son, when I, I hired the guy who created Haskell, you know, is, is, is so don't don't tell us that you're the best Haskell developer. We have better. Yeah. You know, it, so so we have a lot of humility in the in the company and uh, we, we hire for within those lines. And we say we're professionals. We're here to change the world, but we're going to do it with a process. And if you want to go and do some crazy eco trip or something like that, I could go work for another guy and go make some outlandish claims and do an ICO and have fun. And the money will dry up in a few years and you can tell your kids how you were king yeah. of the world for 24 months. The thing is, yeah, you, you, know? have, you have the shot to either leave a, a short term of impact or you can be in it for the long haul. And I like the sustainability right. aspect. I've literally heard little to no projects talking about sustainability, especially at a time when there's so much conflict in the community over whether or not we're going to increase the block size or not, or if you know we're going to put layer two solutions to the Bitcoin network. It's just like, you know, we're caught in this bickering argument when we have literally the potential to build a revolution in the way we think about money and also you know decentralizing entire industries. And right. I, I see exactly what you're talking about. It's become more about money. It's become more about short-term gain. People don't look at sustainability long-term. So I really do like that and I, I appreciate it. Again, Charles, I mean, it's, it's nice to hear this kind of stuff. It's refreshing. Yeah, but, but uh, yeah, so I, I was just going to go through on the list here. Uh, so sure. we, we went through a little bit on Haskell. We talked about that. Ouroboros I wanted to talk about because uh, you were talking a little bit about it earlier, and I know we can't get too exactly technical in it, but it's a, a basically a provably secure proof-of-stake system. So there was a few different problems that I was learning from. I was watching some of the academic videos uh, from one of the professors uh, who focused on this, and he was talking about things like grinding attacks, nothing at stake, and circularity. Could you talk a little bit about that, those kind of issues sure. with traditional proof-of-stake? Yeah. Okay, so first uh, let's let's go through the super fast ar armchair version of how, how does Ouroboros work and what is provable security. So uh, you know when we first said, hey, we're the first provably secure proof of stake protocol. Uh, all these people, including the Tenderman people, and I said we're secure too. We're not making a statement on whether our competitors are secure or not. What we're saying is provable security actually has a cryptographic definition. It's even got a Wikipedia page if you're cur curious about it. So it means you set up a security model. You've defined your adversary and his capabilities and your assumptions you're making, and you wrote proofs 
that you're secure within those assumptions and given that adversary. It's a very technical thing and takes time and effort. Uh, and if you're curious about how it's done, you can look at our proofs and you also look at the Wikipedia page and uh, read like Intro to Modern Cryptography from John Katz and you can, you can follow that approach. So that's provable security and we did that. Okay, so then the second thing to mention is what the heck is a consensus algorithm trying to do in the cryptocurrency space? And actually this wasn't an answered question until 2015. It's kind of ironic that proof of work came out, uh, and you know, back in 2008, and then suddenly, uh, you know, we 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 had this idea of uh, you know of, of a consensus algorithm creating a blockchain, but we didn't even have a security definition of what a secure ledger is. So Agalos Kayasis, um, Juan Gray, and Nico Leonardis wrote a paper. It's called GKL15, where they defined what is a secure ledger, what is a robust ledger, and then the first thing they asked is, does proof of work actually create that? So you have bedrock, which is what are the properties a secure ledger should have, and then what types of consensus algorithms could create a secure ledger. So the answer is yes, proof of work actually creates a secure ledger. So it's a good algorithm, and you know you got to give Satoshi credit for heuristically creating something to create something so secure and elegant without doing a rigorous security analysis. So that's a, a stunning piece of engineering. Okay, so then the next question is, can proof of stake actually create a secure mm -hmm. ledger or not? Now, this is a big debate, right? You'll see Greg Maxwell and a lot of the guys from Blockstream say, oh, proof of stake is never secure, and they'll give you a lot of reasons for it, some of which you just mentioned, and we can go in those in a moment. So basically, uh, the first thing that we did with our analysis is ask, given a kind of a, a weaker, not so practical version of proof of stake, uh, you know, nothing to make an honest majority, uh, strong synchronization requirements, these types of things, is it even possible to create a secure ledger? Because if you can't create it in the simplest possible case, there's no way to create it in, in the a crazy scalable. Crazy mm. cases, right? So the answer is yes, and that's what we proved last year. And that paper has since gone through six revisions, and it went through peer review, and we're very happy with the design. So now it's a game of saying, how do we make the protocol practical? So you go from a synchronized environment to a semi-synchronous environment, because that's the way the world works. You want to be able to do things like bootstrap from the Genesis block, you want to be able to generate random numbers very quickly, these types of things. Okay, so how Ouroboros works in its current design is you have kind of two inputs going into a function, and they create an election to fill out something called an epic. So that function is kind of like, it's known as follows the Satoshi. And the two inputs are random numbers and a distribution of wealth. So let's say there's three people in our system, Alice, Bob, and Bill, and Alice has 50% of the stake, Bob has 25, and Bill has 25%, right? So using that algorithm, uh, they should proportionally have chance of winning slots in that epic uh, to the amount of stake. So if you have 50%, on average, you should get 50% of the slots. 25%, you should get 25% of the slots and so forth. So the security analysis that we did showed that if you lay out the world this way, using combinatorics, you're actually able to prove that as long as the honest as uh, the majority of those slot leaders are honest, that the protocol will actually be equivalent in security to proof of work. And so now all it is a matter of doing is saying, can you get real random numbers? And the answer is yes, you can use multi-party computation, or you can dirty it a little bit and use random oracle. And there's ways to improve it over what Next and others have done. So the random number side of thing, easy, and that's been solved since 1999 uh, through Schoenmaker's algorithm from Crypto99. It was just a matter of, can we make it fast enough? And that's what we did with Scrape. The follow Satoshi algorithm, we, you know, you know, Bentov and the other guys came up with it. It's uh, the more abstract term you'll hear in Algorand and other papers is cryptographic sortition, but you know that's that's solved and it's not a super mentally complicated thing. Where the Blockstream guys get really angry and upset is this idea of, well, basing the election on your distribution of currency, mm -hmm. saying that it's a plutocracy. The wealthy people who have uh, the most uh, will be uh, the ones who should be most likely to win and show up. Now, in practice, if you add a delegation scheme, usually that has worked. That's something that we've seen with uh, delegated proof of stake since the BitShares days. Mm -hmm. So we strung all these mechanics together. Uh, and uh, and after we strung them together, we did a security analysis and we showed that, you know, we think the protocol works quite well. Now, we did not do a full economic analysis. The underlying assumption of the protocol is that there's honest majority. So how do you create an honest majority? Is that even necessary? You have two levers you can pull. One lever is the carrot lever, and one lever is the stick lever. So the carrot lever 
is paying people, saying if you show up and you do your job and you perform, we use inflation to reward you. This is what Bitcoin does. It says you have a block reward and it creates mm -hmm. a competitive equilibrium where lots of people are running in and eventually somebody wins and, and that, that competition is what sustains the Bitcoin network. Now the carrot lever says that if you don't show up and don't do your job, something bad happens. Now that bad happens can be as little as your transactions are slower in the network for some period of time to you can't transact for some period of time to uh, you're going to face a penalty or potentially you lose some of your tokens. So this is the notion of bonds and penalties. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's the analysis that Casper is trying to do. You know, and that's what Vlad and Vitalik, they're running in circles, trying to figure out how do we create the one game theoretic model to rule them all. It's actually called mechanism design or reverse game theory, where you start with a goal and you try to construct a game to produce that outcome. Normal game theory is you have a game and you try to figure out what are the equilibria that the game will provide. So you're doing the opposite. Um, so anyway, we have a team at Oxford University led by Elias Kosupas. He's a Girdle Prize winner. The Girdle Prize is kind of like the the, the step down from the Nobel Prize of computer science. And he's a really famous algorithmic game theorist. And what we're doing is right now writing a paper about how we think you should overlay for our particular flavor of Ouroboros a system of penalties and rewards that would incentivize an honest majority. But this is an inexact science, just like economics is an inexact science. So the best you can do is an educated guess with some empirical evidence, some good mathematics, and then you launch it, and then you can fine tune it over time, and then you see how the, the network runs. For example, there's all kinds of anomalies that normal economic analysis would tell you that, that they shouldn't work at all. Uh, if you look at Bitcoin Cash and Ethereum Classic, these are both examples of that, where you fork something, and you create a pool of value that Bob never paid for. So the rational action of Bob would be to sell at any price, because mm -hmm. he sells for one penny, he's still making more profit than what he's paid for it. And Bob thinks that everybody else is going to sell. So Bob has an expectation that it's a race to the bottom. So he needs to get out as quickly as possible. So there shouldn't be an incentive to, to save in that per, type of a system. So, you know, it's common sense, naive way of looking at the game theory behind that would be the e equilibrium would be a race to zero. Yet the fact that Ethereum Classic and Bitcoin Cash and other systems have somehow survived at least in the short term, seems to be a counterexample to that notion. So similarly, when you look at incentive schemes for you know, these types of protocols, it is really tricky. But the point of Ouroboros is to build things in modules and layers. So first you separate things up and you say there's the epic, the slots, there is the source of randomness, there is the election mechanism, and then there's the people eligible to be elected. Every one of these things is parameterizable. You can take MPC for one source of randomness, that's the best you can get, but it's very slow. Or you can put in random oracle and just use a hash of something, but that could be subject to grinding attacks. So you have to decide how much performance you want to have. In terms of your election mechanics, you could do things like, say, if there's some metric of importance or quality, where you've been a good actor in the network, the election will be biased towards you. Or similarly, you could say if you've been a bad actor, like you haven't shown up historically for your slots, it penalizes you and prevents you from uh, doing something. Or if you hold on to your coins and don't move them from long, some long period of time, you have a greater chance of winning. All of those are parameters in the way that we designed Ouroboros, and yet the security analysis shows that you still, with just some modifications, could potentially have a secure ledger. It's easy to prove that under different parameterizations. And similarly, those slots, right now we have them at 20 seconds in Cardano, uh, there, you can have them be variable with Ouroboros Prowse, the new version of the system. So one of them could be two seconds, another one could be five seconds, one could be one second, and so forth. You cannot show up on time, but you still have a secure system overall. Eventually, you get consistent. And the way we're adding the game theoretic model on top to promote an honest majority is exactly the same way. So if our analysis turns out to be suboptimal, we can put another analysis on top, and we haven't lost any ground. That's how you design protocols properly is you design it systematically and you first define what is bedrock, what does security mean? Then you say, can you even achieve it in the simplest possible case? Then you say, what makes the protocol practical given the users that I have, the type of network topology I want to have and the performance guarantees that I want to have for the system. Why did we have an Epic? Because one day you can run Epics in parallel. So instead of electing just one committee, you can elect N committees. You have committee one, two, three, four, and then you can shard transactions and say, okay, committee one's going to take this group, committee two going to take this group, and so forth, all the way down to N. 
So whatever any one of those epics has, you, you know, just times it by however many committees you have, and that's your maximum throughput for TPS. What does that tell you? As you gain more users to the system, more you gain more resources in the system, which is exactly one of our design principles that we have. But here's the problem. Unless you have a definition of security, and unless you really clearly understand how these things connect together, there's no way to guarantee that when you go one to N, that system is going to be secure. There's no guarantee. Further, what happens when you have to do inner shard communication? You don't know. You know what, what is that going to do to your system? So, uh, so it's it's a complicated protocol. We've written a lot of uh, papers about it. We've we've you know put up a lot of videos about it. Um, you know things like long range attacks. That's uh, that's resolved in the practical engineering sense with checkpoints, and that's a short term solution. And if you have a strong root of trust, doesn't matter. But if you're a purist, the only way you can do that is uh, bootstrapping from Genesis. And that means you have to use more complicated cryptography, namely um, forward secure signatures and pseudorandom functions. And we think we have an idea of how to do that. But it's actually a classic problem, proof is taken. It's a pretty hard problem. And it's one I don't think anybody's fully solved yet. So in the short term, we'll be having subscribable checkpoints. And it just allows people to quickly bootstrap and not have to stay synchronized to the system. But for those deep states where people disappear for six months and they come back and they need to choose between different chains or different versions of history. We believe we have a mechanism to create synthetic algorithmic weight that allow you to bootstrap from Genesis. And then another things like uh, nothing at stake attacks, you know, that goes into a more classical economic attack. And there's some, there's some really interesting things to think about there. Like for example, the exchange problem. And a lot of delegated proof of stake systems have to deal with this where you are gonna have actors in the system who do not own the currency, who will be holding a large chunk of the currency. So if I, I take a lot of my you know, tokens and I put it into Bittrex or I put it into Polynex or something like that, well, then all of a sudden they inadvertently have 10% of the stake. Mm -hmm. So because they're in control of it, they technically could delegate it or something like that. So this is actually one of the th reasons why it's taken us so long to think about how we want to design our delegation system, because it's an area that we're kind of uh, kind of considering a bit. We're not so worried about the classical nothing at stake prac, which is after your keys have expired, you you know resell the keys and you know mm -hmm. do something and maintain multiple chains, uh, or if there's nothing, uh, no reason you can't vote for multiple chains at the same time, because in the in the latter case we have a security proof again. In the former case, if you use forward secure signature schemes and pseudorandom functions, you can't do that. So there's the the, the answer is a clever combination of delegation, of good cryptography. Of good engineering principles, uh, you know, that are practical, like checkpoints, and then just some original research. We think we can resolve some of those problems. Some of which we've already resolved in our security analysis. Other ones, which are, are a little bit more theoretical in nature, or we haven't actually seen in production systems. Like Next has been running since what is it, 2013, and we actually haven't seen these types of attacks. Uh, I'm, I'm not so worried about, and I don't think they're going to become terribly prevalent. Um, I think people get a bit too obsessed about theory. You know, say, ah, oh, well, there's this one attack that could potentially happen. <laughs> and so as a consequence, we have to now use more power than the entire country of Ecuador. To make sure it does it. <laughs> a million dollars an hour. Oh, and by the way, our asynchronous decentralized system is going to end up totally synchronized and tightly federated off of subsidized power in China as a consequence of it. Yeah. So they I didn't really think the whole thing through, right? You know, so... so so it's 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 complicated and, and the issue i have with these types of conversations is i'm happy to sit down and talk to a distributed systems guy at a conference and go in, in very exhaustive detail or talk to a game theorist and go in very exhaustive detail about pros and cons and accept trade-offs what i'm not happy to do is to go to reddit or to twitter and have somebody say i'm better i'm smarter i've solved this problem uh I look at my white paper it's three pages long it has no math in it and i know what i'm doing or, you know, we've deployed this currency and because no one's hacked it in this amount of time, somehow it works. And that's that's the, the level of discourse we have. Or on the proof of work side of things, they're just damn convinced that proof of work is the end all be all. And there's just no other solution whatsoever. There's no other way to ever do things. And they've solved this problem. And so it's perfectly fine using more energy than an entire country to maintain a network that can only do seven transactions per second. I think I think a good way to put it would be that everyone's caught up on Satoshi's vision rather than making a new vision for cryptocurrencies. Right. And what they need to do is take it as it is, which is Satoshi did something that was duly remarkable. One, mm -hmm. he came up with a way of creating digital scarcity, 
uh, and, and, and and a very novel, very clever consensus algorithm. Two, that algorithm is actually secure without a security proof, mm -hmm. which is so rare. Uh, so you got to give them credit for that. That, that. That's like hitting a hole in one three times in an 18 hole game. It's it's not common. It never happens. Uh, kudos. But what he didn't do was build a global scale payment system mm -hmm. that can process billions of transactions per second, uh, handle billions of users, and actually somehow find a way to move all that data around, store all that data somewhere. That was never in the original design scope. It was a proof of concept. It was obvious it was a proof of concept. Said as much repeatedly. Expected the network to fail repeatedly. Uh, and yet uh, and yet it worked. So I think that you give have to give his due to the, to that vision, but at the same time you have to realize that these problems are now growing in complexity above and beyond the original design. And just like we wouldn't continue using, uh, you know, uh, COBOL to write all of our applications, programming languages have evolved a bit, or continue using a command line interface to, uh, unless you're George R. R. Martin, you know, to to write a novel, uh, you know, it's it's very important to to you know say that maybe techniques, technology, and concepts need to evolve a little bit to accommodate the fact that we're going from an experiment to a production system. And that's what we're trying to do with Ouroboros, is we're trying to reimagine what the development process needs to look like, both on the research side and also on the engineering side, and tackle these problems in a very systematic way. The other thing is because we're writing our work down carefully, unlike certain other competitors, people are free to fork it, and people are free to take it in different directions. You know, our papers are already starting to get cited by other papers and researchers, because they've read our papers, are now freely able to take a different pursuit mm -hmm. and solve different problems or even try to solve the problems we're trying to solve just a little faster. My honesty is I don't really care if IOHK ends up creating the end paper for Cardano or if that paper is completed by uh, another group. I'm agnostic to that. I'd actually be so happy if some other group wrote a paper. It'd save us the time and the money. Uh, but... <laughs> But, you know, at least now they have a chance to do it. One of the things that's really dismayed me is that a lot of the research being done in our space is so secretive or it's it's done in a very unfriendly way, like check the GitHub or talk to the developer and so forth. And there's no basis upon which to, to know if you've actually been succeeding or not. You know, what are what are the things we're actually trying to solve? What are the foundations we're actually trying to live with? The whole reason we did GKL 15 was that we didn't even have a notion of what is a ledger and what does it mean to be a secure ledger? If you look at IOTA or Hashgraph or any of these other direct acyclic yeah. graph systems, what the hell are they actually trying to do? That's I was going to ask you about Hashgraph because more and more people have been talking about it. I know a, a big finance guy I follow, Mike Maloney, recently covered it. And I was like, wow, I didn't know it was getting out there that fast. But um, you know, I was interested in these other systems like mm -hmm. IOTA and uh, Hash, Hashgraph as well. But it's all closed source and it's not open to the public and developers. And I don't feel and like it's also, also what is the security yeah. definition. So like, mm -hmm. what does it mean to have this hash graph, this direct day cyclographically? Like, what, 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 what property should I as a user reasonably expect? Mm -hmm. And, and how do we rigorously go about showing that these properties are satisfied? Yeah. You know, there, if you look at the proofs in the underlying papers, I, I know Sergey Popov, he's a great uh, mathematician. I, uh, the guy who wrote Tangle, which is what IOTA is based on. Mm -hmm. These things were done in a very, these things were done in a very hand wavy sense. It was like, well, we have a general notion of what we're attempting to accomplish, but it, the level of precision and rigor is just not there, especially if you're attempting to build a massive system that has strong guarantees about its availability and performance mm -hmm. and, its, and its quality and its security. So uh, I think everybody just needs to take a step back first and say, what is the definition of success? What are we actually trying to do? How will these systems evolve and change and grow under different conditions? And then once that's well-defined, then you can actually start reasonably talking about proving that your system satisfies those properties. What's the rush? I mean, we're talking about a financial stack for 3 billion people who don't have one. That's not going to happen tomorrow. That's going to take decades. So why then should we rush the core protocols of the system just so that we can have first mover advantage? I mean, the first time one of these things breaks and everybody loses their money, do you think they're going to love your protocol and love your brand now that they're broke yeah. and that they lost all their, uh, you know, their, their life savings? No. They'll hate you for the rest of your life and sue you out of existence. So you should take a step back and really approach things from a very methodical way. And then you can get a lot more collaboration that way, too, because then you have common threads. The problems I try to solve with Cardano are distinctly different from the problems other systems are trying to solve. We're not trying to replicate Filecoin's problems, but we may share some commonalities, for example. And now we can collaborate. We can research together. We can do things together because we agree on the bedrock.
and we can share this way and we're not so competitive anymore as opposed to saying well eos is better than cardano or cardano is better than ethereum or plasma is better than this or polka dots better than this it's just so crazy the, yeah. the way the space yeah there's there's definitely i think a childish undertone and stuff and really i think we're all here on the same game and as uh, you know in the sense of kind of game theory we all want cryptocurrencies to succeed mm -hmm. Yeah. So Charles, again, I mean, and I could listen to you probably talk about this for hours, man. I, I have absolutely enjoyed having you on and, and learning a little bit more about Cardano and also your kind of theory on, you know, building sustainability for the long term, because that's the biggest problem I see in cryptocurrencies right now. I see a lack of consensus in the community uh, and being able to come to simple agreements, uh, building a system of governance and then being able to fix the issues of cryptocurrency scalability right. and interoperability. So. Charles, again, uh, man, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on. Uh, and I want to thank you for taking the time to come on here. Tell me a little bit about what you guys are aiming to do. Um, is there any resources real quick I could, you know, you could point to everyone and I'll, I'll leave the links down below if you uh, got any for me, but uh, I'll put them in the description. I'll, I'll give you a few. So um, first off, uh, cardanohub.org is, is kind of like the heart of uh, our project. So anything really major we post there. I think you can subscribe to the newsletter and so forth. Our Reddit, I think it has over 20,000 subscribers now, and we try to put our weekly reports there. CardanoRoadmap.com is the uh, official roadmap place. Every 30 days we do a rolling timer because we mm -hmm. want to always add some things. It's an accountability metric. Um, you mentioned sustainability a lot, since so you like that topic in particular. We just did a whiteboard video with Vin Chang. He's a professor that works with oh, us. Cool. It's about 40 minutes long, and it explains how our treasury system and voting system works. Uh, in a lot more detail using zero knowledge proofs and added hey, there you go. I love zero knowledge proofs that's awesome okay, there you go. So, uh, so I'll send you a link so you can put it into the uh, show notes and there's also a companion paper alongside that uh, so that's certainly really cool and of course I'm always available on Twitter IOHK underscore Charles uh, so just you know s send me a tweet or something like that and I you know, you know yell at you over Twitter or you can yell at me <laughs> we'll figure it out uh, but uh, overall uh, the Reddit's probably I'd say the best place to go and I think there's a Slack or a Discord channel or something the foundation cool. maintains. But I, I, I used to be part of the Slack, but they moved from Slack to something else. And so I don't know what the something else is. <laughs> I have to, I'll have to look it up. So start with the Reddit, and then that's probably the good place to go and move yeah. on from there. Awesome. Well, sounds good. Well, Charles, again, thank you. Really awesome to have you on here. And uh, I'll make sure to leave the links down below. But guys, I hope you all enjoyed the interview with Charles and getting to learn more about Cardano. I know many of you out there were extremely excited about the project. So as you all know, I don't like to cover too many projects or do too many interviews. But much like the ones I've done in the past, I'm extremely confident in Cardano. And again, all the best of luck to you, Charles. And uh, I hope you know you and the rest of the team do quite well in this endeavor. Hopefully, you can build a sustainable project for the long term. That's what we're all expecting here. All right. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you very much, Charles. Appreciate it.